What's up? What's up, y'all? Hi. Happy Wednesday. Excited to introduce today's rec session host. How's everybody feeling? What's going on? What is going on? I know I just made some coffee or some tea, and it says it is not talking of love, but living in love. That is everything. So thought I'd share that special note with you all today. Um, before we hop in, I do want to just drop some links for members. Um, for those of you who are just joining us from the community, um, anyone who's not a member, there are some links that we'd love to get your feedback on, um, specifically for programming. So just give us a heads up on you know what you've enjoyed thus far for our virtual programming. Um, a heads up on you know what you're looking forward to, something that you'd like us to add. So I am going to post this here. Let me see. I'm gonna post this in just a second. I'm actually, gonna have Anaya post these links. For some reason, my chat isn't working. 
But while she posts those links, I'm going to jump right on in with the introduction for today. So as mentioned, today we're hosting our rec session, Timeless Transitions with Cosmo Baker. Cosmo Baker is a DJ, musician, entrepreneur, influencer, brand consultant, educator, activist, community leader, and Philadelphian. Um, he's acknowledged universally as one of the top DJs on the planet. Cosmo has toured the planet dozens of times, playing in almost 50 different countries on five different continents and in front of tens of thousands of people at once. He's widely recognized and regarded as an integral figure of the already rich Philadelphia DJ legacy, alongside with some contemporaries such as DJ Jazzy Jeff, Quest Love, and Diplo. As a master of open format, Cosmo's known worldwide for his genre spanning selection, his technical prowess and explosive stage present energy that he brings to his live performances. A true DJ's DJ, Cosmo musical vision very keenly bridges the gap between the forefront of musical innovation and the history and legacy of DJ culture. So today, Cosmo is going to be talking to us about staying relevant and transitioning through the times as a full-time DJ, which right now is super important, super, super crucial. Um, so for all of those tuned in, help me give a warm, warm welcome to Cosmo Baker. Hey, how you doing out there? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, wonderful. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm really excited about this. You know, first of all, it's great to be involved with Rec Philly. This is my first time uh, doing anything with you guys. Uh, and I've been an admirer of of the organization and the institution uh, for several years now that I've known of you guys. Uh, and you do such great work involving the creative community here in Philadelphia. So, like my hats off to you for real um and uh you know philly's a real special place it's my hometown so so much of what philly is i'm just like it's like i'm i'm hardwired i'm a hardwired philadelphian i guess so i feel really proud that i represent philadelphia and also specifically uh as like a philadelphia dj for so many years so um I'm really glad to be able to have this this chat with you and to kind of talk about some of the stuff that I, I know and some of the stuff that I've, I've been through, uh, specifically in the area of now as we try to transition into this new era of, uh, of the world. So, um, you know, one of the cool things about being a Philadelphia DJ is that, like, you know, I've been able to represent my city everywhere I go across the globe, and it's really such a part of my identity. Um, as a Philadelphia native and also as somebody that's I lived in Brooklyn for about 15 years um, and when I returned to Philadelphia and I found it was one of the best places for creatives as well as for creative entrepreneurs. So uh, it's kind of like this amazing uh, 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 breeding ground for all this uh, this cool stuff that's happening. So, um, you know, also being as somebody that's speaking for Philadelphia DJs, that really is an honor. For me because Philly DJs are a bit of a breed apart like historically we're always been known uh, throughout the community as being cut from a different cloth yeah, from DJ Jazzy Jeff to King Britain Josh Wink to Questlove to Rich Medina to Diplo who may not necessarily be originally from Philadelphia but you know you give him his kind of his Philly pass a bit um, to folks uh, cast from the younger generation like uh, Matthew Law and Jaber <clears throat> Philadelphia DJs are kind of globally recognized as leaders and masters of the craft. Recognized worldwide as being forward thinking and progressive, technically amazing, and more, most importantly, <clears throat> most importantly, soulful. So Philadelphia DJs are an extension of the Philadelphia music community that has so much soul in it. And of course, the greater creative community. So uh, one of the things that I want to actually ask first is like, why are Philadelphia DJs so good? And people always say, like, hey, Philadelphia DJs must be in the water. It must be in the water, well, or the water. Um, but no, it's not in the water. Um, two reasons why I've always thought that Philadelphia DJs are so good, and I'm speaking about this with all humility. Um, first is because of the physical proximity to New York City, right? 
New York and Philadelphia have always kind of had this big brother, little brother uh, dynamic. <clears throat> and New York obviously being like the, the birthplace of hip hop, um, you know, Philadelphia has always kind of had to, Philadelphia DJs have always kind of had to do whatever they can to kind of one up their big brother. So that's one of the reasons why I think Philadelphia DJs are so good. The second is because here within Philadelphia, uh, the audiences are usually pretty hypercritical. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pretty hypercritical. Um, they expect the best. And so if you do not deliver the best, they are going to let you know. I remember coming up as a DJ and, you know, if you weren't good, you, you learn to become really good really quickly or else you wouldn't be able to get on the set anymore. And yeah, I, I've been booed <laughs> many years ago, but um, it's a real thing. So, you know, one of the things about it is, is my journey as a DJ has led me to many different places on this globe, but also to many different stages, stations in life, from being a business owner and an entrepreneur to being an educator, a community activist, and whatnot. So I hope that some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about today is going to resonate with you guys. And even if you're not a DJ and you have a different creative discipline or you work on a different medium... I truly believe that the experiences that I've had and the things that I've learned are relevant to anybody who wants to run a creative business. So today I'm going to be talking about a bunch of different subjects, but it all kind of has a common thread. And that's about the process of evolution that runs alongside the steady change of time. Also during today's workshop, I'm going to be giving a presentation on how you can tackle live streaming, different tools and tricks and tips on how to get started, and some of the things that you're going to watch out for in your journey. It may seem like it's kind of daunting, um, but trust me, it's actually way simpler than you may think. Uh, it, <clears throat> in addition to that, and we're going to try to attempt this, we're going to actually do a live stream on another platform, which you're going to be able to see here in this Zoom hangout, um, which is pretty meta in its own right. Um, <clears throat> a few other things. Today, I'm going to break down a routine, which I created last year for an event called Bastard's Barbecue, which uh, I've done with my friend Scratch Bastard from Toronto. Um, so you can kind of get a, a look into the creative process, and I'll let you know about kind of the idea of why I wanted to do, make this routine uh, and in regards to this question of staying relevant. Um, it's going to be on Serato DJ Pro, and you guys are going to be able to see this whole uh, thing on this meeting. It's interesting. We're all getting so adjusted to all this new technology, <laughs> and it all seems like it's kind of a <clears> – <throat> it's like a brave new world, but uh, we're getting used to it really, really quickly. Um, so in this discussion about staying relevant and finding ways to transition, I guess in order to really do that, I have to kind of tell my story as a DJ. Um, I've never really had any sort of blueprint – I've never really had any sort of roadmap. I just did what felt like it was the right thing to do and trusted my gut and trusted my instincts. So to kind of describe that and how that has been, uh, how, how that has allowed me to stay relevant and to keep a, uh, a career going for 30 years at this point, I'm going to have to tell my story. But I want to put it in context too. In order for me to tell my story, I have to, speak about how I see my relationship to the larger story. And I have to start all the way back in the beginning. And it's the very beginning of the story of hip hop, dance music, and nightclubbing. So you got to ask yourself, where did hip hop technically start? Most people are going to say the Bronx, 1973. <clears throat> now, you're not going to be wrong if you actually say that. Um, but it goes back a little bit deeper than that. And the, the true genesis of hip hop... Uh, has its roots in the island of Jamaica. So way back in the 60s, there was, uh, uh, 60s and the 70s, there was a, a, a huge disparity of economic uh, disaster that was happening in Jamaica. Um, and obviously, the at that time, the 1% of the 1% were seeing all the benefits of a, an, an unjustly stacked system against people who were oppressed and people who are were... Uh, living in poverty out of that and this is going to be part of a, a, a common narrative that we're talking about <clears throat> people decided that they wanted to uh kind of create parties and celebrations uh to kind of forget about the the woes that they were going through living in the ghettos and the slums so um that 
kind of created that kind of came about in what we want to say like dance hall culture but more specifically sound clash culture so i don't know if you guys know about this but what exactly is a sound clash sound clash is basically two different sound systems from two different areas or two different clubs or two different crews right and they go and they battle each other the way they would battle would they would set up one sound system <clears throat> and they would go against the other sound system. Now, whoever had the bigger system or the more powerful system, um, they were usually deemed the winners. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but then you had all this other, uh, you had these other elements, which were the people that were manning the sound systems, right? And they were the disc jockey and the selector, right? So nowadays you think about the disc jockey and the MC, but in Jamaica, it was the disc jockey and the selector. In the parlance of DJs that we know about, the, the DJ in Jamaica, that was the selector. That was the person that was selecting the music. The MC in Jamaica at that time, they were actually called the, D, the DJ, the disc jockey. Um, and the reason why, it's because if you can imagine um, like a horse, like a, like a, like a, like a horse race, like a, like a horse jockey. Um, the disc jockey was the person that was riding the beat, they'd be riding the rhythm. So one crew would go against another crew. They would clash, and it was usually in fun, sometimes not. Um, and what would happen as the disc jockey would learn to ride the rhythm that he would or they would uh, you know, start to figure out different rhythmic patterns. They would learn how to uh, get creative in the stuff that they were talking about. Um, they would learn to shout, shout out different people, different neighborhoods, different sections of town and whatnot so that in essence was basically uh the blueprint for hip-hop djing and emceeing that we know of in modern times so how did that go to new york well there's a guy named cool herc uh, i was supposed to be sharing uh sharing photos here but i'm actually going to skip that there's a guy named cool herc cool herc is considered kind of the godfather of hip-hop in 1973 he uh, through a party for his sister. Her, his sister wanted to make a little money for back-to-school clothing, um, so he decided that he was going to um, play some records, play some music for this party. And that was generally accepted as the night that hip-hop was born. So the thing about it is, is we know hip-hop music is, you know, you know, whatever school you're from, whether it be, you know, Beanie Siegel or Run DMC or, uh, you know, the baby or whatever it is that you want to call hip hop. But back then hip hop didn't exist. There were no hip hop records. Hip hop was consisted of James Brown records and uh, Barabas records and Led Zeppelin and Kraftwerk and uh, you know, all these other things which ended up kind of becoming this pastiche uh, where they were taking little bits here and little bits there and kind of putting it together. So hip hop didn't exist. They had to create it themselves. Now, that was the first pivot, going from something which was uh, 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 this very inventive uh, art form to actually e establishing that in itself as its own singular entity. As that ended up growing and growing, it gained ground, it started getting widely accepted, started getting uh, uh, brought downtown to different sections of, of, of the city. Um, and it started getting co-opted as well. And then the hip hop artists decided they wanted to pivot again. And that's when guys like Larry Smith came in and started to start mess with drum machines and make it a more like electronic sound. And you'll see that throughout the history of hip hop that there are pivot after pivot after pivot. It was always a time that within the culture that they decided they wanted to make themselves not just relevant, but also provocative and make themselves kind of ahead of the pack. And that's this uh, that's a story which is still pretty relevant to this day. So you think about that, the first pivots and the first ways of kind of keeping relevant is really kind of rooted deeply in the DNA of the culture. All right, so let's rewind back to 1969, all right? This is a whole nother lane as well. 1969, there was a place called Stonewall Inn and it was a, a, it was a gay and lesbian, an LGBTQ community, uh, uh, bar and nightclub. It's mainly populated by black and people of color, 
uh, uh, LGBTQ community members. So back in that time, uh, you know, there I, I don't think think that uh, like dancing with a, a, a member of the same sex or intersex dancing was even I think it was illegal in New York City. So in 69, the NYPD, they came and they tried to break up basically a, a dance club, which was a gay dance club. Uh, and <clears throat> the people who were there in that club, they resisted and they fought back against the, the, the NYPD, which then had this ripple effect and reverberated and really kind of was one of the, the first sparks of the, the gay uh, rights movement. It was, a, it was an act of resistance and it was an act of resistance that was kind of rooted in an act of joy. You know, they say that joy is an act of resistance in itself, right? So they were able to take this, uh, you know, this wonderful happening, which was dancing and commuting and, and, and congregating with each other and, and create something which was much bigger. What it ended up also creating was uh, a, a need for safe spaces for people within the community to congregate. So jump forward about a year later, 1970, and there was a guy named David Mancuso, and he started this uh, this thing called The Loft. And The Loft was actually his loft. It was where he lived, and he was throwing a rent party. Um, and uh, it was Love Saves the Day, LSD for short. And David Mancuso was kind of also the godfather of, one of the godfathers of dance music, right? So what he ended up doing was he was this guy that decided to bring in all sorts of different people within his community and create these incredible experiences. And the music that he played ended up becoming the template of both disco and ultimately this whole experience became a template of the modern day dance club. So what everybody kind of knows of with modern day dance clubs really kind of goes all the way back directly to David Manacusa's The Loft, which is rooted in change, it's rooted in resistance, and it's rooted in innovation. <clears throat> so I'm really proud to say that this is the legacy that I belong to. So when I first started DJing 30 years ago, one of the first things that I really thought about was what I wanted to do to discern myself as a DJ. I knew all the DJs that were uh, on the radio. I knew all the DJs that were playing house parties and whatnot. And I always knew that I wanted to do something which would make me stand out. Um, one of the first things that I remember, and obviously I'm like, I'm not the only person who's done this, but within my community, uh, I definitely was uh, one of the first person that I heard my heart doing it, that in playing hip hop music, hip hop music was, that's my love. That was my entry point into DJing. Um, that I decided that I was going to start raiding my mom's old record collection and finding all sorts of different stuff, jazz and funk and all sorts of oldies. Been able to, to find ways to connect the dots between the old and the new and to find a way where I can present that out to people in these parties. And we were just teenagers, of course. And most teenagers don't want to listen to Sline Sly the Family Stone, um, but we do want to listen to the Jungle Brothers. So when I was able to hear that there was a sample source there, and I finally found a way of actually presenting that within my 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 sets and my dance floors, I saw that it was resonating with people in a way that uh, I had I that I had never seen before. So that was one of the first steps that I I took in my career creatively uh, to set myself apart from the pack, right? Um, now, out of that, started meeting a lot of friends and a lot of people within the community. Um, just a few years into my my DJ career, I was uh, I was introduced to and kind of taken under the wing uh, by King Brit, who was somebody who was uh, a deity to me, and still to this day is just an incredible both human being, friend, and uh, an artist. <clears throat> And I was able to kind of see what a lot of the stuff that he was doing musically. And uh, and uh, it's, it's, I, I don't want to say I, I bit it, but yeah, I, I kind of, I saw what he was doing and I wanted to copy it. You know, they say copying is uh, the most sincere form of flattery. But, um, and also there's the, uh, the, the Picasso quote. I think it's attributed to Picasso that um, talent borrows, genius steals, right? It's it, it 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 doesn't make any sense if you are to do that, 
but you don't find a way of putting your own twist on it. So with a lot of the stuff that I was able to kind of see in the sense of my contemporaries and me emulating them, but wanting to then take it and mix it and make it my own way, um, that also was a bit of a pivot for myself because it's a way of standing out of the pack. And there was a lot of that happening around that time. This is the early 90s. There was a lot, a lot of innovation that was happening within the community. Uh, and the community itself was very rich. There was a, a hip-hop shop right off of South Street. It was called The Layup. And uh, it was where everybody would go, and they would have all the the clothing that people wore at the time, Triple Five Soul, and, uh, and you could get your mixtapes there. You can get your graffiti caps there all sorts of stuff. I think Echo Unlimited had just come out. And one of the things about going to the layup and just hanging out is that it really reinforced the sense of community. And I'm going to come back to this later in our, our talk, but being attached and really being entrenched in your community is a really important thing because uh, it's going. it will end up being something that will help you stay relevant uh, and succeed by building your community and helping the community thrive. You don't want to just suck your community dry for your own personal advancement. That way, that may seem like the short payoff, but in the long term, it's not going to be the way to go. If you stay principled and you can leverage and lean into your community for decades to come. So, you know, for instance, there was these two guys that were playing music outside of the layup and they were a few years older than me. I was a teenager and they would just right off the South Street, they would stay in there, they would uh, do their busking, right? And uh, I created a friendship with these guys, Tariq and Amir. Uh, and they ended, they called themselves the Square Roots. Uh, eventually, obviously, they went on to become the Roots. Uh, and one of Philadelphia's preeminent, most, most legendary groups of all time. Uh, and two people whom I could say happily that I'm still friends with. Uh, and our friendship is actually based on the fact that we had that community back then and the community we looked out for each other. Um, you know, I've known Questlove since 1993 and still to this day we're homies. And, uh, you know, if he gets booked for a gig and he can't do it, he'll hit me up. So um, that also is another thing which is going to be really important in your quest for staying relevant is staying entrenched in your community. Okay. Um, <clears throat> shout out to my friends at Red Bull. Thank you. So one of the things about me as a, both a person and uh, as a creative is that um, I've always been very hungry and I've always been very curious. And that's something that's a really important thing for every creative. You know, you don't want to be stagnant. You want to make sure that you're personally and creatively progressing at all times. Um, one of the things which I did in the mid nineties, which helped me progress was I actually moved from Philadelphia. I know, I know. Um, and moved to New York. So I was in New York, I lived in Brooklyn for about two years. <clears throat> this is the mid nineties. Uh, and it was a really uh, amazing time to be living in New York. Um, if you could imagine, and I don't even think I was 21 at the time. If you could imagine being a nightclub DJ, uh, in New York downtown and, it is the time and the era where, oh, there's a new Biggie Smalls record out, a new Biggie Smalls song that just came out. Oh, let's play it at the club, see how it goes. You know, this uh, a new song by Mob Deep, Shook Ones Part Two. You know, let's test it out at the club. I mean, there was such fun memories and also such an amazing power to having been there at that time in New York to have witnessed that. But also on top of that, during my time in New York, it was when I really started to learn how to run myself as a business. I started to see lots of DJs uh, learning how to network, DJs who were learning how to kind of work and leverage within their communities <clears throat> and to have a bit of solidarity with the brands that they were building at the time, especially with a lot of the downtown clubs. Guys like uh, Stretch Armstrong, uh, Mighty Mai, Mark Ronson, guys like that, people who I've known since then see kind of the stuff that they were actually doing uh, and doing to kind of set themselves apart from the pack as well. 
uh, you know, Mark Ronson was play at uh, on Tuesday nights at this place called Den of Thieves, which I would play at on a Saturday night. And he was one of the first guys that I was really seeing and hearing, you know, mixed oldies and like the classic samples with uh, the, the contemporary hip hop that was happening at the time. So, I mean, that was a real revelation to me because it also validated the way that my mind thought and allowed me to kind of step outside of my comfort zone and to say, hey, you know what? You can kind of do this. You can kind of do this on the regular. You can do this at prime time and find out ways that it would actually connect with your audience. So shedding off of the fear and shedding off of the hesitation to to do that um, was a huge thing which allowed me to progress as an artist and to kind of put me at ahead of the pack as well. Um, and I think that that's a, 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 a huge thing as well, uh, in, as well, because as artists and creatives, we have inherently a lot of so, we have a lot of uh, self-consciousness. You know, being a creative person and expressing yourself is basically opening up a window to your own vulnerability to like a big crowd, a big crowd of strangers. And that's kind of a scary thing to do. Uh, I was actually talking with uh, the team, the Rec Philly team, before we started this off tonight, and I was saying that how nervous I am today to be here having this talk with everyone. Um, and that's an interesting thing because I've been doing this for 30 years and I've DJed in front of crowds as big as like 25,000 people. Um, but I still get nervous every time I'm going to be in front of people. And even now it's more so because this is like strange because I don't see anybody out there. But that nervousness is good because it allows you to feel as if though that there's something which is burning inside of you that you want to get out. And that's really something that's really an important part of the creative process in me. I think in general as well. Um, you have this thing that you want to get out as a creative and it's something which is so personal. That it's, you, have, you, you have ownership of it and you don't want to let it go the minute that you actually do let it go and the minute you present that work or that art to the world, you kind of lose ownership of it as, uh, in a sense, but the ownership transfers to everybody else that's experiencing it, experiencing that. So, um, you know, shedding off that fear and finding a way to tap into that, that confidence, even if you might not necessarily be a naturally confident person, you know, that's a, a way of, again, stepping your game up and, really separating yourself, separating the wheat from the chaff, right? You know, that allows the people to recognize that you are out there and you're actually putting the work in and you're, you're sharing yourself, which is something that resonates with the people. So that time in New York for me was a, a really formative time. Again, I was really, really young and I was learning how to uh, 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 both tap into my creative spirit, express that in front of large crowds, um, I also learned to start to diversify the stuff that I was playing. It was in New York, but I really kind of discovered house music. And um, you know, at growing up in Philadelphia, it was not necessarily the thing that I was into. It was almost alien to me. Uh, but there in New York, it was so intrinsically tied with the club culture that I kind of threw myself into it. And the idea of me not necessarily being scared to approach and embrace a new idea and a new sound ended up being so beneficial for me it ended up not only just uh not only influencing my sound across the board and allowed me so many different types of skill sets so that if i wanted to play a house set i could do one with proficiency if not really good uh, i would learn how to mix house with hip-hop and it would give such a broader spectrum to the music that i'd be be presenting but it also really uh opened up a whole bunch of doors for me in the business aspect of it because I was working for a record store uh, and record company called eight ball records. And at one point I was the low man on the totem pole, but uh, at one point they actually enlisted me to be the guy that would go to nightclubs to present promos to some of the biggest house DJs on the planet. You know, I walk up to the sound factory bar and with the new promo of whatever the thing that it was that I was presenting them with. And, you know, I'm, I'm Cosmo, walking up to Frankie Knuckles. Oh, hi, I'm Cosmo Baker. Like, here's your promo, you know, and, uh, you know, Louis Vega, here's your promo. And, uh, you know, within months, uh, I ended up 
meeting these guys and actually becoming friends with these guys. And that opened up opportunities for me uh, to actually open up for some of these amazing DJs or play in the, the downstairs room. Uh, it was a uh, kind of the, again, the shedding of the fear and the learning to step forward in confidence into the unknown ended up being something which was incredibly beneficial for me on the business side of my career. And also there's a, a club, I had mentioned it earlier, a club called Den of Thieves, which was downtown on Houston street, Houston and uh, Bowery. And, uh, the owner is a guy named Rob. He's actually still a dear friend of mine. And Rob was uh, the owner, but he also was a DJ. We connected on the love of music, right? Rob lived right upstairs. And there are times when the DJ would uh, call out sick. The DJ that he had on a Wednesday night or a Thursday night would call out sick or just wouldn't show up. DJs sometimes are not the most dependable people. <laughs> and Rob would happily just DJ the night for free. I mean, he owned the club, but he would he would do it happily. But one thing really kind of struck me, and it was at the end of one of the nights when I was DJing, I would DJ Saturday nights, and I saw him, and the, the club was closed, and the bathroom was uh, in tatters. It was in shambles. There was water coming out of the toilet. It was just a mess. And Rob was cleaning it. He was cleaning it. And I said to him, you know, kind of snarkily in the way that like a 20 year old would say, Rob, like, why are you doing that, man? You got the janitorial staff coming in next, you know, tomorrow or get one of your employees to to do it. Uh, and his response, although it may not necessarily be verbatim, was Cosmo, if I want to run my business right I need to know how to run every single aspect of it, and I need to be willing to do that. And that really struck me. Um, and I've always kind of tried to follow that path for my entire career, my entire life. And, you know, if you kind of think about it, kind of take a step back at it, there's that saying, you know, jack of all trades, master of none. I don't believe that in the slightest at all. And I don't think anybody should ever ascribe, subscribe to that philosophy. Obviously you want to be the best that you can be. And obviously people have uh, different heightened skill sets and maybe some things they're not necessarily as proficient with, but you want to actually have some sort of handle on the broad scope of everything that is within your business and also everything that is within your creative skill set. And it's the embracing of that, that I have really kind of put forward in everything that I do. And it's also been something that's allowed me to kind of stay ahead of the curve again and again. So after living in New York for a few years, I moved back to Philadelphia and, um, I had all this musical knowledge and all this business acumen. And it was out of that that I started a party called The Remedy. And The Remedy was every Monday night uh, at Fluid. It was me and my partner, Rich Medina. And uh, it was out of that that I actually really learned so many more uh, aspects of the actual business game, you know, from the creative as well to marketing to branding accounting scheduling right um which that's that's a lot it's definitely a lot to handle uh i'm gonna actually pull up a little screenshot here boom, boom, boom. you got a little there's the zoom i'm gonna share the screen Am i sharing screen okay so this is a picture from the remedy this is me a young boy it's black thought obviously common with jazzy jeff and uh yeah so it was really kind of a spe very very special time uh, in my life but also in philadelphia uh hip-hop and kind of party going culture in general uh you guys uh, still hear me i just want to make sure because this screen sharing stuff is was getting funky earlier um, so 
running the remedy was a, and ended up becoming like a full time job. And uh, it was out of that that <clears throat> I really started to kind of struggle with the duality of looking at yourself as a person, looking at yourself as a creative person, and then looking at yourself as a brand, right? I, I was talking about kind of the sensitivity uh, the creative people have. And there's a lot that uh, can be said about when creative people kind of get wrapped up in their self-identity uh, that they're presenting to people and uh, and who they are when they get home. So it's a really important thing to learn to discern yourself from that. That's also going to be something that will help you going forward, <clears throat> both as a creative person and also uh, uh, in your business, but also just as a person yourself. You know, I am... Um, you, 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 creative people are also uh, myself very much so uh, we definitely hold ourselves to a really high standard and that's something which is beneficial because it will allow you to really pursue your craft uh, to be, be the best it can be but when it doesn't necessarily pan out or it, you're not hitting a grand slam uh, it can be a, a pretty difficult thing to deal with I've got a, a uh, so you have to kind of learn discipline and that helps with not just the uh, advancement of your sound and the advancement of your art, but also helps keep a business, a stable ship. Now with the discipline, uh, when it comes to your art, uh, my therapist, he's have got this theory, uh, this concept, and it's called the John Lennon versus the Paul McCartney theory method, right? So we all know John Lennon and Paul McCartney, the famous singer-songwriter duo uh, of the Beatles. So they're two kind of different uh, workflows with those two guys. John Lennon is this guy that, uh, and the Lennon method is, John Lennon is this creative guy that he will produce and he will create when the muse comes in, when the passion strikes, when he feels the fire, right? And for many years, I thought that that was me. I thought that, that was the way to go, right? Then you have the McCartney method, right? And the McCartney method is all about diligence, right? It's about getting up. It's about putting in some work. It doesn't matter what comes of it. Put in 30 minutes of work. Put in an hour of work. Put in your time, time and time again. You know, they have the concept of the 10,000 flight hours. Um, that's like the McCartney method. Just keep on working, keep on working, keep on working. As you work, things get more refined, things get better, things get easier for you. So over the, around this time, I really started to adopt the, the McCartney method. And it's the McCartney method that has allowed me to really kind of, again, really progress through, uh, you know, the evolution of staying relevant. So kind of coming back to the remedy, you know, the sound at that time was, if you can imagine like a, a prototypical Philly late nineties, early two thousand sound, very organic. It was concurrent with the Neo soul sound. And, uh, uh, then one day I was listening to, uh, the radio. No, I was actually, I was actually watching a video and I heard a sound that was unlike anything that I ever heard. And let me know if you guys can hear this sound. I'm hoping you can hear. We we're, we were sound testing earlier. Okay, I hope that everybody heard that. But if not, it was uh, the clips grinding. So I heard the song and it flipped my wig. I never heard anything like it before in my life. It was so progressive, it was so futuristic, it was so forward thinking. Uh, and I think that now, in retrospect, everybody kind of acknowledges that it was like this massive shift, right? Uh, I immediately started playing clips at my club, and it alienated me from people. It alienated me from my audience. It would clear the dance floor. It would make people, like, 
I don't want to say boo, but yeah, they would give me thumbs down. They would, the Cosmo, what are you playing? Go back to playing some boom bap stuff, you know? Uh, but the clips at grinding was a real kind of watershed moment for me because I had been somewhat uh, aware of different regional sounds, but, you know, Philadelphia, we are all kind of, we're in our bubble a little bit. And I've made a very pointed decision uh, that I was at that time really going to start to approach and playing all these new and different sounds, uh, even if it ended up being that I alienated people. Um, unfortunately, at the time, but in retrospect, it actually ended up working out well for me. And um, and that was a, a a decision that I think was kind of rooted in, uh, I, I guess, bravery, maybe. Because I personally, myself, I felt as if though I was burnt out with the sound that I was banging away at for years. And I really needed a challenge. And that's another thing that I really believe lends itself to staying uh, relevant, which is the, the focus of the day. That challenging yourself. If you feel as if though that you're kind of getting in a rut, you're going to be the first and first person to know. You're going to know a lot sooner than your audience. And it really pays to listen to yourself. So when I kind of knew that I needed a shift, which ended up being kind of a massive shift, um, I decided to kind of throw all of that sound by the wayside and really start going full in on this new sounds. And, and uh, it actually ended up being that a lot of people in Philadelphia were not really hearing me at the time. And I ended up shutting down my party, The Remedy, uh, at which point I moved to New York. And I teamed up with two uh, other DJs, DJ Ayers and DJ Eleven, and we created a party called The Rub, which uh, we did for 10 years. And The Rub, I think, is kind of widely accepted as being like a, a really important uh, party, especially through the 2000s, along with <clears throat> Holotronics and uh, the guys that ended up becoming Flostradamus and the guys that uh, did Fool's Gold, like A-Track and, and Cash Dubs. So, um, so yeah, so this was, again, kind of re reaching out and going into the unknown uh, with confidence and really being unafraid to be provocative we, I have a saying that, um, you know, one of the things that we we do is that we know cool before other people do, and they want cool, but they don't know what cool is, and so it's like up to us to say what's cool. So, around this time, this is when we really started to kind of go in on all these different types of sounds and cross genres, and nobody was doing that at the time. Everybody was either hip hop or dance music or house music or whatever it was. And, you know, we were really kind of branching out and allowing ourselves to really go knees deep, waist deep, neck deep into what this open format thing was happening. There were guys in LA that were doing it. Uh, AM was doing it. There are a few other people around the region that were doing it. I was approaching it from a very Philadelphia DJ perspective. And that is that when I first started going to nightclubs when I was a kid, you heard everything. You heard rap, you heard R&B, you heard slow jams, you heard, uh, you know, mommy bass, you heard classics. So, um, you know, that was my mentality going into this. Most people that were coming to the dance floor had never heard anything like this whatsoever. And the way that we were doing it um, was again, so provocative and so with uh, pure intent that it just ended up flipping people's wigs like crazy. So that, again, was another pivot and allowed me to kind of stay ahead of the curve. Also, one of the things about playing open format is that, in a sense, I've always kind of looked at it as though, though that is truly rooted in hip hop itself. Because as I said before, hip hop was created. There was no, um, there was no uh, hip hop records. It was all breaks and weird stuff. So uh, again, it was kind of honoring 
the true essence of hip hop in itself. So around this time we were doing this, but then probably the biggest sea change of DJing, at least in, in my lifetime happened. And um, this was in the early two thousands. And this was the introduction of digital DJing. So digital DJing, which is DJing that we all know it as of now, um, has been probably the biggest game changer. And you have to think about kind of what it brought, right? It heightened the creativity and that creativity has been able to uh, expand exponentially since at least the first time I started using Serato, which was 2005, right? So yeah, so 15 years ago um, with the ability to play whatever you want, however you want and, and, in different ways and different manners access to music which you never had before which really kind of opened up the playing field for for everyone and this was something that i decided that i was going to go in uh head first and uh to many people's chagrin <laughs> we started getting really funky and getting really weird a lot of people but you know never cheesy you know but it definitely allowed us to really kind of reach out allowed me to uh, to reach for so many different types of sounds and incorporate these things into my overall uh, presentation. That uh, ended up being something that became this bedrock for almost ever, almost exactly how I play it today. And uh, it's been an important thing ever since. So the the willingness to embrace new, uh, especially with both sounds and technology, is something that will always help you out. It will never hinder you. The sound wise, you know, you as artists and as creatives, like our sound is always evolving, uh, just the way as we are evolving as humans. And we evolve with our personal sound, which runs concurrently with the way that the sound that is out there in the zeitgeist uh, is evolving. So you know, it depends on how you kind of create that uh, that the um, that balance between how it is that you see sound and how you see your art and the way that others see your art. Um, with digital and the embracing of digital, uh, that's going to be like a huge thing, especially as we go forward with uh, with streaming. And I'm going to get to that in a little bit. But um, with the digital DJing, there was a, a lot of different stuff that was great about it. Heightened creativity. Um, the ability to play what you want. Um, also, one of the things that it allowed was it kind of created like this whole gig economy that all of a sudden DJs could just hop on a plane and fly to L.A. or fly to Minneapolis or fly to, you know, Indianapolis, you know, or overseas without having to worry about lugging big crates of records. So out of this time with digital DJing, coupled with uh, a lot of the stuff that was happening on the internet uh, with uh, specifically message boards, because this was all pre-social media, um, that we were able to create these micro communities. And it was out of these micro communities that not only were we able to kind of basically set up gigs and, and mini tours where I would, I would be able to go and play six or seven dates um, from big rooms to medium sized rooms to even small rooms in Kentucky and, and, you know, uh, uh, Montana uh, and get my name out there and that was a really important thing especially well up until pandemic uh, the fact that able to have that and have these communities uh, and these these micro communities so that you can continue to tour that was a, 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 a huge thing uh, there are these communities online too and we're kind of being able to see that uh, especially over the past several weeks. For instance, I was booked to do a, a party for a, a, a nightclub out of San Francisco called Love Supreme. And this was last weekend. And obviously I didn't fly to San Francisco, but they had a party on their Twitch channel, which had Travi, who was the opener, me, who was the, the main guy, and my man Katsu, who... Uh, finished up 
they had hundreds of people that were tuning in. We all played our sets. We played it just like it was a real party. Um, it was a paying gig. Uh, and it's interesting how now kind of that model of the micro communities that we were all using in order to tour and make money off of in real life is now very quickly getting adopted to virtual. And there's a lot of stuff with this virtual. We're going to talk about it in, this, uh, in a little bit as well, but um, it, it's moving so quickly. <clears throat> so one of the other things also about uh, the advent of digital DJing is that, which was a bad thing, was that it made the entry point for DJing so easy that all of a sudden the market was flooded with a proliferation of really, really bad DJs. So um, one of the things that I had to do was again, to work myself to work really hard to set myself apart from the rest of the pack. You know, if I'm working hard uh, in a, in a collection of 50 DJs and I'm towards the front of the pack and all of a sudden there's 50,000, I have to work extra hard. And that's still as relevant as it is today because everybody's a DJ and the accessibility is so much easier. So um, again, in order to, uh, to stay stay <laughs> stay relevant, it takes a lot of hard work. Um, not just with uh, the the discipline of the practice, uh, the uh, things that I was talking about, the embracing and learning of new sounds, new ideas, the uh, the technology, the the fostering of good community. It's a really important thing, but also staying true to your creative voice. You know, I, I've been through so many different incarnations in my life, uh, but whether I'm playing 70s soul music like I do on my Sunday broadcast or if I'm playing disco on my Friday broadcast or hip hop on my Monday or, you know, weird electronic music, which I do every once in a while, it's all still kind of rooted in my voice. And it's really important that you find a way of finding the commonality in what it is that you play so that the people hear your voice through the music. You know, you should never ever be afraid of reinvention. Like I was saying with, uh, with playing the clips to crowds that would just disappear when I would play it, you know, now that's a, a classic record and, you know, it's the, one of those things that, you know, we understand that, okay, yeah, cool, I was right. Um, and also, challenging yourself. I think I said this before, but it's a really important thing to challenge yourself. Uh, and don't, like, get, don't rest on your laurels. Don't get comfortable. Because the minute you start getting comfortable, then somebody's going to be coming up from behind you. And I'm saying that not necessarily like in, in a competitive way, but, you know, you are your biggest competitor. So that's a really important thing to to stay aware of. So, you know, uh, I'm going to get into a couple of things, just kind of thinking of talking about uh, staying relevant and all of these pivots that I've gone through. And not all of them have been music related. The idea of me running myself as a business for the course of X amount of years, uh, the Cosmo Baker business, you know, there were all these skills that I had amassed and uh, you know, all this business acumen that I, I had I had under my belt. And I started getting asked to do a lot of work, which was kind of outside the realm of DJing, whether it be uh, event production or, you know, uh, brand consultation, uh, all sorts of things like that, social media strategy, marketing, all stuff that I knew just basically from waking up and trying to get my next gig. So um, in the early 2010s, I opened up a small fledgling creative agency. And within a couple of years, I was doing all sorts of work, uh, like the types of things I was just talking about for everybody from Burton Snowboards to Virgin to like Uggs to Mural Arts here in Philadelphia. And uh, I remember when I first started it, I was booking for um there's the US Open which is the 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 Burton Snowboards giant uh snowboard championship which happens out in Vail, Colorado and I was hired to produce the after party. I ended up booking 
a bunch of different acts over the course of many years. And one of those, well, I think the first year was I booked Jazzy Jeff. So I remember talking on the phone with him and I was explaining to Jeff, me creating this new business, which I have no idea what I'm doing, but, but I'm trying, right? And I was telling him about what, what this is and I was telling him about what the job that I was asking him to do. And he stopped me and he said, hey, Kaz, I just got to tell you, man, I'm so excited for you. You sound so exciting. You sound so excited. I hear it in your voice. Like you sound like me when I was 17 in my basement touching turntables for the first time. And that really kind of shook me because, I mean, first of all, it's Jesse Jeff and it's Jesse Jeff, right? Um, but the fact that there was such a validation in his words that with him not even really knowing what it is that I was doing, yet at the same time, he understood my my hunger and my willingness to step out and try something new, um, that it was, a again, like a, a, an incredible sense of validation. That in itself ended up kind of pushing me forward to all sorts of other entrepreneurial endeavors, which I ended up doing over the course of many years. Uh, and that in turn also really affected my DJ career. So I was able to kind of excel at one and open up new avenues and new doors through the other. So that kind of goes back to the idea of, of not being afraid of reinvention trying something new you know they they say that um like uh all the fortune 500 companies or whatever like you know the uh, instagram guys like failed 20 times and the 21st time was went instagram right so like that got me really jazzed and that also um made me feel proud in the sense that all of this stuff that i had done and i had been involved with and that i had um been able to create and execute all came from my DJing and all kind came from me wanting to attack that and approach that and really kind of go full steam ahead into it um, and to be the best, to set myself apart. Um, and so that's like kind of like a, one of the, 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 the biggest pivots was that. Um, it was after that that I, 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 was, I had been working with a Scratch DJ Academy in Philadelphia and uh, uh, we decided to open up a branch here in Philadelphia. No, I'm sorry, in New York, and we decided to open up a branch in Philadelphia. So uh, we opened that up in 2014, uh, 14, 15, I can't remember. And it was great. That was actually a, 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 an incredible experience because it allowed me to kind of see what it's like to run a, a company of that size or business of that size and to have employees and also to employ friends, which is like a great feeling as well. Uh, and that opened up a whole bunch of opportunities for me to do some bigger event productions. And I'm going to screen share this one with y'all. Okay. Share. And here's a, an a event that I did in 2016. Oh, spinning wheel. <laughs> Okay. All right. All right. All right. Cool. Can you guys hear me still? I hope so. All right. 
Uh, yeah, so that was uh, something that I was uh, one of the producers of. It was called Truth to Power, and it was uh, in conjunction with uh, Rock to Vote and Cut 50 and the Soze group and here in Philadelphia, uh, Little Giant and Mural Arts and the Rail Park and a bunch of stuff like that. So basically, in a nutshell, uh, all these things that I have been able to do has because has, has happened because I have been a DJ and I've been able to kind of go forward in this and not be afraid and not be scared and really willfully want to stay curious and stay hungry and stay interested. And um, that's really the, the, the key to it all, you know, to, to again, like not necessarily get lazy and to challenge yourself. And if you do that, then the doors will open for you. It's almost as if though that's like the secret, right? Now, uh, now in 2020, things are definitely strange. Uh, we are in this uh, a very strange pandemic that's happening, and I hope you guys are all staying careful out there. And I was talking with the the crew earlier. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a calamity. It's horrible. And it's something that has gotten everybody so uh, rightfully rightfully concerned and worried and sad and depressed. Um, so I was saying that it, it, it might not necessarily be the appropriate word, but it's really the only word that I have for it. I'm so excited about this time. Uh, and I mean that specifically because of the way that we are out of necessity having to uh, embrace the digital technology that is allowing us to stay connected to one another and is serving as a lifeline for both people's interpersonal relationships and also for business relationships. Um, there, uh, my friend of mine, two friends of mine, uh, we've actually been opening up, working on opening up a business. Uh, and when this all happened, it was the business is based in real life events. And when this happened, uh, we realized that we had to quickly retool our model so we were able to pivot and retool and we work rework our model for it to be on a digital platform and uh that is this workout program that we're doing we call it the remedy workout w-u-r-k-o-u-t uh and it is a combination of uh music uh, uh fitness good vibes dance floor it's very very cool i'm gonna oh it's and you can, uh, I'm not going to worry about sharing it. So now here we are in this part, this time where we're all having to learn really quickly how to stream. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I've actually been streaming for a couple of years. So I was not necessarily new to it. Maybe like a couple of years ago, I had the idea that I wanted to do like these broadcasts. And it was strictly off of Instagram Live and I think maybe Facebook Live at the time. And um, I'm like a music nerd, right? So I think it was like Sade's birthday. And or another one was like uh, uh, Sly Stone's birthday. That was another one as well. And uh, I knew that I wanted to play these sets and I wanted to play these sets for people. And I wanted them to actually see me playing these sets. But I also knew that there's no nightclub in the city that's going to allow me to come in and do a... Uh, Sly Stone set, you know. So I started to do them online. I would do them on uh, Instagram Live, and I would do them on Facebook Live. And I got, you know, a modicum of of uh, uh, of response to it. You know, it's definitely kind of niche. But it, without question, allowed me to kind of get my feet wet a little bit. So when all of this happened and the pandemic dropped, uh, I, I remember the first night that I played and it was a Friday night, and I think it was the first Friday after everything had gone on lockdown. I mean, I've been on, a, I've been on quarantine for 65 days at this point, so I don't even know how long it's been. But um, I initially broadcast that night, and it was only on Instagram Live, and I think it was only on Instagram Live. I, only, I initially broadcast that night just because I needed the release. I needed some sort of way to find catharsis in this crazy situation that was happening in the in the world and the uncertainty 
of everything that was just going nuts. And I find that through my passion, my music, and sharing that with people. So I did it, and it was fun. It was, again, like it was a wonderful release. And I woke up the next day, and I looked at the... <clears throat> I looked at the, the the comments and the people that were responding to it, and it was Japan and China, Australia and New Zealand, uh, in the United Arab Emirates and Israel and Turkey, and all throughout Brazil and Mexico and all throughout Europe and all throughout the United States and Jamaica, and um, and Hong Kong, and so I was like, whoa, this is this is nuts. This was just me on a Friday night, and I'm I'm in my feelings. You know, and I'm gonna get out of my feelings about playing some some disco music, playing some Prince records, and to see that that I had that response from people really let me know that, you know, a this is something that's really good, and then b this is something that can be really big. Um, now this is before the night that D Nice went uh, viral, and uh, and I'm no way am I saying that like you know I started streaming at all, you know, but um. You know, and if anything, that night the nice uh, went viral. That definitely pushed this all through the stratosphere to everybody's benefit. But um, it was just kind of rudimentary in the way that I was doing it on Instagram Live and Facebook Live. So I think that now we are going to talk about how to stream, and I'm going to pull this up and screen share. Okay. <clears throat> How's everybody doing out there? I hope you're doing great. Okay. So this is a PDF that my friend Jim Mortco put together. Big big up to Jim. So streaming live setups. Okay. DJs are doing live sets more than ever. There's a few things that you guys want to uh, figure out for your live set that... um. Uh, you really need to, to think about sound connection, platform, and if you're going to use any sort of stream combination service. Okay. Um, and by the way, this will be available. I forget. I was supposed to share this with uh, Rec Philly earlier, but um, I didn't have an opportunity. I will send it to the folks over at Rec Philly so that they will have it somewhere uh, for people to download, figure this out somehow. So when I was starting streaming, I literally was just kind of playing out of my speakers and letting the microphone on the uh, on my iPhone pick it up. Like I put my microphone on this little, I put my uh, iPhone on this little thing right here. Uh, and you really forget about how terrible those microphones are when you hear high quality direct streamed audio, uh, which goes into your computer is. Uh, so well, after we go through this, I'm going to kind of walk you through this in real time. Okay. So this is about Zoom. We're not going to talk about that right now. Um, so this is basically a typical streaming setup. You have your DJ console, right? And then you have an out from your console, which is going to your interface, which can be an iRig, or it can be, if you look up in the, Count right here, it could be one of these, which is a Roland Go Mixer Pro, or there's the other model which they have, which is the just the Go Mixer. They're both very good. So your audio connects to your rig, your rig connects to your camera, your camera is filming. And this goes out to your platform. In Jim's example right here, it's going to Facebook Live. So now here is using your computer instead of a phone. The DJ console, which then goes to your computer. Your video, which comes from your computer. Uh, and this, you know, it would usually be like a, a, a different device, which would then go to your DJ console, which then goes to your platform. Now, this is the configuration that I use, and I would like to show you that now. Okay. 
So in terms of the software that we use, the software that has pretty much quickly become the breakout industry standard is OBS, Open Broadcaster Software. It is a free program. It is for any sort of OX, OS, I'm sorry, Windows, Linux, and uh, Mac OS. And it is sponsored with Twitch and Facebook. And I'm going to open it up in just one second. First thing that we need to do is we need to make sure that we have the audio which streams in. I have my audio, which runs from my turntables to my interface, which is a bit of an older interface, uh, which then connects to the laptop, I'm sorry, the desktop in which I'm speaking to you right here. And we're going to follow the path this way. So the sound comes in here, and I actually run it into Ableton. Um, I hope that that music wasn't playing that entire time. Um, where is that music coming from? I don't know. Um, sorry, one second, please. Okay, so I have my music, which is coming into Ableton. <clears throat> Reason why I have my music, which is going into Ableton, so instead of directly into the interface, is because I have an older interface, and the interface doesn't have a sound card. So what I need to do is I need to use a third-party software, which is this one right here, Loopback, although there are other ones as well, Loopback actually acts as a virtual sound card, which is allows, allows music to come into a computer and then go out of the same computer to a different uh, program, which is what it's doing. And this is sending to OBS. And I have OBS open right here. Oh, wait, I realized I wasn't, I was not sharing that screen. My bad. Hold on. <clears throat> Screen. Okay, so I have my music coming into my computer using Ableton. Ableton is pretty much industry standard for uh, recording software nowadays. I also use it just because I like to record the sets that I play, uh, and I can have that as content, which is hosted after the fact. But again, like I said, my, uh, my, my interface is a bit of an older interface, and it doesn't have a sound card, so I use a secondary uh, application, which is this one right here, Loopback. Loopback, again, acts as the virtual sound card. So it comes in and then replicates it, allows it to go back out. And then that goes to OBS. So here's OBS. It's open. And you can see I'm going over here. So my configuration right here is my turntables, which runs out into my other computer. OBS then allows you to, it's pretty, pretty, it's pretty uh, loud, my bad. OBS then allows us to broadcast with one camera or actually multiple cameras really depends on what it is that you want. So how does that work on OBS? We're about to open it up and show you. What you have is um, you have these things over here, which are scenes, right? So in your scene, let's add a dummy scene. Dummy scene. Okay. You create a scene. And then over here, you have your sources. And this is kind of like a rudimentary uh, uh, intro to OBS. I've only been using it for a few weeks. It's pretty user-friendly but there's so much of which you can do with it. So in this dummy scene that we're doing right here, we're going to add 
we're going to add an audio input capture, right? You have all these different things. You have audio, audio output, browser, color source, display capture, blah, 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 blah. We'll go through a few of them in a few. So what you do is you set up, create new, and let's just use add existing just because we know that it works, right? Okay. Just going to take a sec. I think, I guess. Okay. Yeah, we'll just, we're going to create a new one. All right. So here in your devices, you have your TACO USB interface. That's my interface. So I'll go here. Boom, boom, boom. Loop back. Yeah, loop back. So as you can see right down here, now I'm getting sound. Uh, and then do you want to add, say, like your camera? And you can go here to video capture device, which is if you have a video camera or any sort of uh, camera, you can actually use here. Uh, video capture device here. Let's do create new capture device and for the intent of showing how this works, let's use the FaceTime camera that I am working off of. Hello. How you doing? So then you can kind of create your scene. Then, boom, you can do something like uh, image. Go in here. You can browse. And, you know, let's go to... Let's go to something like... Uh, downloads. That's David Manicuso, by the way, I was talking about earlier. Let's do... Cool Herc. Let's add Cool Herc in here. Kind of put a little, if I'm talking about Cool Herc. And you could do that's cool, cool Herc. And then you can add other stuff. This is, it's relatively, I mean, I'm new to this. So, um, like, I'm just still learning. But it's really, really super user-friendly and wildly intuitive. Let's go to desktop, broadcasting. Boom, du, 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 du. assets. Okay, and you go to here. For some, for some of these PNGs, they're a little big, right? So you need to just kind of set it up. Basically, what you do is you kind of set up how it is that you want your screen to look. And there are people that are doing this doing amazing things with this software. You can cut it right here. And there we go. There's my little screen. So I'm going to click back out onto the chat just to make sure that it's still going swimmingly. Uh, I guess I can't see the chat. I don't know. Stop share. Okay. Okay, good, good. Thanks so much. So now let's actually do a little stream, right? I'm actually going to go to scene two because that's what I've got already set, set up for, right? Now, where are we going to stream to? Well, before we were talking about it, people are streaming to Facebook Live and Instagram Live, and, you know, they're fine, I guess. And also, you know, Facebook and Instagram, that's the thing that people really kind of know, specifically Instagram. They, they you know, everybody kind of goes to that. And it's fun. But there's a few problems with it. So, like, both Facebook and Instagram both face the kind of the same problem, and that is that, A, the sound quality is terrible. 
And the other problem, which is the biggest problem, is that as platforms, they don't necessarily have rights to broadcasting music. Oh, I realize I've been talking for mad long and we don't have too much time left. Oh, snap. Um, anyway, there's a few places where you can actually broadcast, which is the best. And they are going to pull this up real quick. They are Twitch and Mixcloud. All right. And you know, for the OBS, it only allows you to broadcast to one unless you broadcast to using um, a service. Restream.io, which is a service, which allows you to pick multiple... Oh, I got a screen share. I got a screen share. That's my bad. I'm still getting used to... I'm still getting used to Zoom. Thank you for... Uh, okay. So, Facebook... Instagram, blah, 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 blah. But really, the places that you want to stream to are places like twitch.tv, places like Mixcloud, uh, which is, I think, going to be the one that ends up uh, ends up winning the race. Uh, and there's a couple other more, but these two are really going to be the one, Twitch and Mixcloud. Now, uh, going back here to OBS, kind of going right here. In the actual settings, it will allow you to stream to one service, like stream to Twitch or stream to Mixcloud, unless you use uh, like a stream service splitter. And that is something like Restream.io, which is right here. And with Restream, what you can do is you can add multiple platforms here. Like I've got my personal Facebook, Twitch, my YouTube Live, my Periscope, which is a uh, Twitter, RTM, the custom RTMP, which is, uh, that's my Mixcloud. Then you can add a channel, and you can see they have all sorts of different channels. So it's kind of game, 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 game wide on that. Um, so for this, all intents and purposes, let's actually go here, and let's make sure that we are restreaming to, boom, okay. And if I'm Correct. I think everybody should, everything should be good to go. So, start streaming. All right. I think we're streaming. Let's see. Look. So, if you go on... Uh, look. So if you go on, uh, you see, on, uh, so here we are. I've got a stream. You While see, I'm streaming on, uh, you guys. Very easy, very simple. So here we are. I've got a stream. For my Twitch friends, I'm While I'm streaming little, with you guys. Uh, a demonstration. I'll very easy, later. very simple, very simple. For my Twitch friends, I'm doing a little uh, a demonstration. I'll be back later. And as you can see, I'm on Mixcloud. As you can see, I am on, let's go to Twitter. Yep. Oh, it's just kind of loading up real quick. I think after this, I'm going to just kind of, uh, let's go to the Q&A just because I, I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, but you see right here, take a look, boom, boom, boom. All right, so stop streaming. And it's just that simple. It really is. Um, it's really the kind of the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, and people have been getting so incredibly creative with it that, again, it is in, in, uh, immensely inspirational to me. Um, which then goes to what we have been talking about, you know, kind of that excitement of this new time, this, this, uh, this new era where we are forced to use this technology, but we're really kind of going with it uh, and making the best of it. So, in summation, do not be afraid to take risks. Do not be afraid to challenge yourself. 
do not be afraid to try new things. Um, uh, do not <laughs> be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to fail. That's actually like a huge thing because everybody fails at, at, at some point. And, um, and uh, yeah, and thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> no, thank you all so much. I guess that'll be it for now. Um, and, and word up. We want to take some questions. Yeah, um, uh, some of my favorite DJ controllers that I've used. Uh, I, the the new Pioneer one was really dope. Uh, it's at the the DDJ one thousand, I believe. Maybe it's really dope. There's also a Newmark one. It's the Newmark NV. I actually own that. But my favorite DJ controllers are actually um, the Roland series, uh, and it's the Roland. Roland DJ controller. So I've got the 808, which is amazing. It's got an 808 uh, uh, drum machine and, and, and sequencer, which is ingrained in it. And that, along with Serato DJ, makes it not just a DJ controller, but like this incredible, incredible almost production uh, tool. They also have the 505, which is in my opinion, probably the best uh, for like entry level. And I think it's around $500, which is not, uh, it's not cheap, but it's also not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. And it is such a powerful, powerful DJ controller and also has the drum machine in it. And it's made by Roland. So it's not a toy. It's an actual instrument. So yeah, check that out. Um, how do you grow an audience? Okay, next question uh, is how do you grow an audience uh, for your live stream? Just do it. Just keep on doing it. Um, an important thing is consistency, right? So, like, I see a lot of DJs out there. They're going on at, you know, one forty-five in the afternoon because they feel like it and they got bored. They're going on at 2 a.m., you know. They're going on at 11.52 at night. And that's all good. And I, I, feel, I feel them. And there's nothing wrong with it. But... You know, with the shows that I've been doing, two things. First of all, I've been making sure that they're set on a consistent basis, same day, same time. And all the shows, the three shows that I have right now, and I'm, uh, I'm unveiling two more, um, they all have their own individual concept and their own creative idea. And, um, and so it's really important to kind of make sure that you bring the consistency out there because consistency means dependability it means reliability, and that's what people want, it's especially right now when there's such uncertain times, right? So that's the first step. The second step is, like, be really good at what you do. Like, put your heart into it and really kind of think through. There are a 1,000 DJs out there, and right now we're at a place right now where, you know what? We can allow ourselves to be creative. We can allow ourselves to kind of play outside of the box. That's what people want way more so than playing a a a, a the baby record not no no slight against the baby but you know you know like let's do some something which is both challenging and provocative for both ourselves and the people because we you know that's what they want and then the third thing is just keep at it keep at it you know cross promote on all your socials make sure that you have consistent branding consistent messaging uh engage with your people talk with them i see the same people coming back to certain shows the same people come on monday nights every week the same people come on friday nights every week and they say to me cosmo i've been waiting all week for this so like you know so much of that is just me kind of building the rapport with people and they're seeing you there's like this intimate nature of them being inside like you guys are inside my house this is like a real intimate thing so um even though we're, we're we're far away, like we're connected in a real intimate way. Um, okay, so um, that was the question of how to grow an audience for our live streams. <clears throat> do I have the question is do I have any experience with rotary mixers? Yes, I actually do. Actually, the first mixer that I ever played on in a club was a rotary mixer. The first mixer, the first club I ever played at, was a place called Sugar Cube. And it was on top of a Greek diner. And this is like the early 90s. It was a top of a Greek diner at like 18th and Chestnut maybe or something like that. And um, and uh, yeah, so like it was a Friday night and a Saturday night. And it was like an all ages or like a 16 and up party, right? And my man, DJ 
Storm, who was one of the first DJs who ever put me on, uh, he would do the Friday and Saturday nights, and then the Sunday night was the house night, and um, and he used the rotary mixer. So I would open and close for him. So I'm learning how to like play hip hop and cut with like a rotary, you know, and um, and I kind of got my chops on playing off a rotary, and then I ended up getting a mixer, which was like a weird new mark. I I want to think of like new mark 1550, um, which actually King Brick gave to me, and uh. It was a weird, it was like a rotary fader. Um, and to this day, honestly, if I'm playing disco or if I'm playing house music or dance music, like I so prefer the action, at least, of a rotary. A Yuri, uh, it's a Yuri 1620, um, or an old Bozak. I know people laugh at the name Bozak, you know, but um, that's the name of the thing. Two incredible mixers. Um, so, yes, uh Question, are there any international sounds that I'm a fan of lately? Um, also, have any of the international crowds you've played to resonated with, a st- that you've played to resonated with a style that you didn't expect? Great questions. Um, yeah, I mean, as of like contemporary stuff right now, like international sounds, uh, like I've been really getting into this. Uh, there's this band that, uh, they're a Japanese band, but they like do Japanese versions of cumbia and Japanese versions of Afrobeat, and um, and they are called. I will tell you right now. Um, they are called the Minyo Crusaders. M I N Y O, um, and they're dope. They do like Japanese uh, uh, salsa, Afrobeat, uh, but it's very much Japanese, so it's super super dope. Um, also, have any of the international crowds that I've played for that uh, resonate with a style that I didn't expect? Um, yeah, I mean, when I played in Brazil, I didn't really know what to expect, but I remember the first time I was there. No, nah, maybe the, the th- third time I was there was with, during a World Cup. It was me. It was J-Rock. It was Mike B. It was... DJ Day, we were playing, we were doing the do over over there, right? So, um, <clears throat> uh, I came in and I said, you know what, man, Brazil, they got their Bailey funk, they got the weird. So I went in real heavy on like a, on like a contemporary, like New Orleans twerk set, uh, and it leveled, it bodied. I was gonna say it bodied the room, but it was an outdoor club, an outdoor spot. Like people were going nuts, and it was like, like they hadn't ever heard this before you know and that was definitely something that's cool about being a dj that's coming from another country and bringing a sound um that maybe people are a little bit familiar with uh you know um uh on the internet and whatnot but actually having coming in there and 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 uh presenting it live is a different thing i remember the first time i played in uh helsinki which was god i mean like maybe 12 or 13 years ago at this point and i was doing a big party it was me and Giles Peterson and Cut Chemist, and I was going on last, so I was like, "All right, cool. I know what to do. I don't, I don't even know what to do, you know." Cut Chemist had killed it, and Giles, of course, killed it, and uh, and so I just came out and I just played like the ill set of Baltimore Club, and this is in the this is in the mid to mid to late two thousands, and uh, you know, in Helsinki, they had never heard anything like that ever before in, in their lives, and um. Yeah, and it, it was a room of like maybe like five or six thousand people, and and it just leveled leveled the floor, and that was my first time in Helsinki, and it was after that that I ended up being invited back to play Finland. Probably I don't know eight or nine times since. That's probably one of the countries that I visited the most. Finland. Shout out to all my 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 uh, my my Finnish homies out there. Um, question: What is my take or taking risks? breaking records in a club setting and how can younger DJs honor older DJ culture? Great questions. Um, okay. So my take on taking risks is hell yeah, do it. Take a risk, right? Trust your gut. If you think something is good, right? Understand that you are the person who has your finger on the pulse and you are the person that's creating, uh, uh, the vibe and the experience, you know, the experience in that club is an extension of what's inside your mind and in your heart. And also, all the you know the the years of music that you've listened to you know i, I think that if, if you it's like the 
you know, the saying, like, you're not booking me for the two hours that I'm, you're not paying me the number that I'm asking for, for the two hours that I'm DJing, you're paying me for the 30 years I've DJing translated in that two hours, right? Um, so definitely trust your gut. And if it fails, try it again. Like I was saying earlier on with the clips, man, I would play it again and again and again, and it would, it would, it would bomb. But the, the, the first week it would bomb. The second week, there was three people on the floor. The third week, there were 10 people on the floor. I remember, um, I remember when Buster Rhymes Put Your Hands Where My Eyes Could See came out, right? I was teaching at a place called the Palmer Social Club. And, uh, you know, I knew immediately, well, any Buster record is going to be a smash, right? So uh, I knew immediately this was going to be a smash. And it was just such a dope beat, but it was also weird. It wasn't sounding like anything that was out at the time. Um, and I remember the first time I played it, it was early to the middle of the night, and it cleared the dance floor, you know? I ended up playing that song probably four or five times that night alone. It was like the first night it came out. And so from the time when I played it, which cleared the dance floor, to when I played it at the very end of the night, I played it at the end of the night and it was a packed dance floor. People were rushing to get on the floor to listen to that song, you know? So definitely just kind of stick to your guns and do it. And if you could find a way of, of you know, creatively introducing something, if this song somehow reminds you of another song that you know gets a good reaction on the floor, then maybe try to be creative and, and sneak it in on the sneak tip. Um, and as to your second question, how come the younger DJs honor older DJ culture? Um, by sticking true to what it is that they believe in. Understand it. I mean, like, there's a long lineage and heritage of this DJ culture. And, you know, I think a lot of older DJs get, like, a, get bent out of shape. Oh, these young boys, blah, 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 you know, they're not doing real DJing, you know. I think that part of that is because the younger generation has consistently kind of won. You know, the younger generation has consistently really been the ones to push the envelope and to and to be the ones that actually end up uh, enacting change. Uh, and a lot of the older DJs uh, usually, I believe, are somewhat kind of scared of that, right? Because they don't want to change. They're, they're, they're happy playing Gangstar records or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, but you could just honor the older DJs by, by doing you and doing it in reverence and respect to not the older DJs, but to kind of like the lineage of what everybody's done. Breaking records, like you were asking earlier, breaking records is honoring the lineage of DJs, if that makes sense. Um, hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, all right. Any more questions? I guess. I don't know. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, am I gonna? Up, oh, hi. Hey, I'm back. Thank hi. you so so much. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank my pleasure. Thank you so much. I was really. Oh, <laughs> I, I gotta, I gotta admit, I was like, I was like really nervous about filling in all the the, the time, right? Yeah. And then I was like, oh, man, hold on. Where did all the time go? <laughs> yeah, you did a great job. Thank you so, so much for hosting. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today for our rec session, Timeless Transitions with Cosmo Baker. He is the GOAT, the legend, the OG. So thank you so much for tuning in with us, sharing your time and energy with us today. Um, for those of you who are tuned in, check out and stay tuned for our follow-up email. Um, we have some survey and some feedback links in there, so we'd love to to hear you know what your thoughts are on our virtual programming and what you'd like to hear more of um, moving forward some announcements so programming for the rest of this week we have two member events the first happening tomorrow we have creative coaching um, hosted by our co-founder will toms that'll be hosted on zoom and on saturday we have office hours at ballard spar um, that will also be hosted on zoom from 2 to 4 p.m our next public event is this friday we have our live with rec virtual concert and showcase um, we have khalil phillips dj dj royale is also djing um, and 
as performers, we have Lexa Lay and Luke O'Brien. So you will not want to miss this experience. Um, trying to keep the typical Friday vibes we have. So definitely tune in with us. Um, check out that RSVP on recphilly.com slash events. We'll be streaming just like today on recphilly.com slash live and Rec's YouTube channel. And with that, I thank you all again. Enjoy the rest of your hump day and I will see you next time. Peace, guys. All right. All oh. right. Wow, wow, one, two, uh, one, two, uh, and go off, go off, yes, yes, y'all, and freak, freak, y'all, until the beat, y'all, it's so sweet, y'all, see, I was walking down the street, then I pushed my brake, oh, yes, I ran into my man, Jazzy Jeff, and did it to death, the jest, and got to it, and got on the MI, up inside the fluid, the B to the L, the A, the C, K, I rock to the B, R, E, A, K, up door, and get on what my man call, rock, on my left, the number one, the number one, North said, Lines are limited to a limit to lime. Black thought, rock the rhyme and have the time. MC spitting tactics, you know that they mind. Yo, I design a whole shit. Fifth, the whole clique represent infinitely. The MC representing SP and the place to be. Jesse Jeff is on the one and two. I'm from the legendary Roots Crew. None of you, some of you coming through. Think off a shot again. Yo, picking a whole entire plot again. MC's forgotten it. I came back to rewind this. Remind kids, now yeah, I'm saying up in the realm, you're overwhelmed. Just freeze, black don't spit. It's for the enemy, you know what I'm saying? One test is up. My nigga, please just rest the justice. Get serve all the fifth, get it. More spurt, hold up, more herbs. Wanna rush, but this is on a low and on a hush. It ain't nobody fucking with us. We just bust. My man, call. Hey, yo, you know you're the pump. Just get on the mic and rock and rock. Rock on, rock on. Black dog, that's tough. Consist. This is what we do, 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 do. It was consist. Let me tell you what I mean.